Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs, home of the Ennis paintings, and we are very proud of that. We have a special presentation for you tonight, a special night of concert music, the Follies, the Follies de St. Pete, featuring the uh, St. Pete Baroque Ensemble. And you will notice uh, these speakers are not working tonight because we want, that we want you to hear these period instruments just the way they were meant to be heard and the way they were heard many, many, many years ago during the Baroque era. era. And um, I'm sure you'll enjoy it more that way. So that's why we're speaking a little bit louder because we have no, uh, no, we have no speakers. Also, we welcome those on Zoom and on YouTube streaming live. We hope you enjoy it as well. We hope that you'll have a great time. And um, we also have a light reception afterwards. Don't forget that. It will be through the door to my left, your right. And um, there's lots of uh, wine and good things there. And I've just found out we have one of Reverend Christina's chocolate truffle cakes that you can taste. If you've never tasted her chocolate truffle cake, promise you, it'll send you right to heaven. Uh, also, I've been told that we're auctioning a couple off, so do you like it that much? You know? And also, I will remind you, while a lot of the Ennis paintings are here in our sanctuary, this is not all of them, many more are in our forum room, which is which you enter, to, enter from the social hall. Uh, the ones there are very impressive, very emotional. I know you'll enjoy them. They are, they, those paintings there are some that everybody finds to be their favorite. And that's a difficult thing to say when you look at all of these. If you're hearing impaired, as am I, this entire concert and everything is being looped through our sound system, and of course, then YouTube and Zoom, but it is also looped through your hearing aids, and most hearing aids will pick them up and do quite well with them, mine do. But if you have trouble, we have headsets available and you can easily pick one up and uh, make use of that so that you won't miss anything. Now, I believe that covers all of it except for one thing, those of you who have to use the restrooms, that is also in the social hall and you get to it by exiting this door. Uh, you'll find it, you will find it there. So now, I believe everything has been done. Yeah, oh yes, yes, thank you. Telephones, if you haven't already silenced them, please do so now, okay? No interruptions. You can't. There are, I'm looking at at least three, maybe five back there. If, if you'd like to go ahead and move, that's, that's great. Just feel free. But we do want you to be able to hear this. The harpsichord, all of these uh, Baroque instruments are period pieces. They are very unique. Their sound is unique. And I know you're going to enjoy it. And I believe we're almost ready to go. So, now, without further ado, I will say one thing, and that is you have a program upon entering here. Look at your program, and that you will be able to follow all of the pieces that they are playing here tonight. And I believe that's it. So, without further ado, 
Let's start the music.
Okay, thank you all so much for being here today. I'm going to turn on this microphone. There we go. Okay, thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Dan Urbanowitz, and I'm the artistic director and founder of St. Pete Baroque. So I want to say a special thank you to Kathy Hopkins for coordinating nearly every detail of what in, uh, went into making today possible, so thank you, Kathy. And also a special, yes, yes. And a special thank you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs for hosting us in this absolutely gorgeous space. So I'm so proud to say that this is our final concert of our third or second season. We have season three coming up and we already have some performances lined up and we certainly couldn't have done it without you all being here today. So again, thank you. Um, I'd love to say a few words about the ensemble before we move on to our next piece. Uh, we are the only historical performance ensemble playing on period instruments in Tampa Bay and all of the west coast of Florida for that matter. So what is a period instrument? Well, that means that we're focusing on the Baroque period, so 1600 to 1750. So either we're playing on instruments of that period or historical recreations based on examples left behind. So some of us string players are playing on gut strings. Yes, that's sheep and beef because um, that's what they would have used. It's a little quieter, it's a little richer, but they, they're really finicky, they go out of tune quite a bit. So we'll beg your indulgence as we tune a lot, because it's worth it to hear it in tune. I guarantee it. And um, yes, and so the harpsichord uses steel strings, and it's a plucked instrument if you're not familiar with it. So you press the key and there's a little quill that plucks the string, and this instrument uses uh, steel strings as well. Okay, so... Um, Lastly, you'll maybe you'll notice that our bows are a little shorter than the modern bow. I've got a modern bow here for comparison. I'll hold them up. So the Baroque bows are a little shorter. They're a little pointier. They're a little heavy on one end, and they're light at the tip. So this means that the music kind of decays, and so there's a lot of breath, and it's great for dance music and a lot of general sighing, whereas the modern bow, it's meant to sustain a tone all the way through to the end, and you can play long lines of gorgeous romantic music. So that is what we're playing on. Um, and if you have any questions about the instruments, we're all total nerds here, so if you want to come and talk to us, we're happy to nerd out about our gear. So please do that. So for our next piece, we're going to move back in time about 45 years to a convent in Italy. Uh, Isabella Leonarda was born in 1620 near Milan, Italy, and she lived to be 84 years old. Yes, that's right, 84 years old in the 1600s. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would really love to know what they were serving at that convent. Um, so women composers in the Baroque period were incredibly rare, um, so it's quite a delight that we could feature two of them here today. So women composers were either members of the nobility, um, such as our last composer, or nuns in convents where intellectual activity was uh, promoted, but generally their efforts were sadly kept in private or, more often than not, their male counterparts were taking credit for their work. Um, so, Leonardo entered the Collegio de Saint Orsola at the age of 16, and eventually she held the position of Mother Superior. As if she wasn't already amazing enough, she didn't even start composing until she was the age of 50. So, and by the age of 80, she had written 20 books of music. Um, so this piece I'll be playing for you is one of her very last works, it's very special to me, um, and it was composed in 1693, and this piece was written 107 years before Corelli wrote his violin sonatas, one of which you'll hear Sarah Shulman play in a bit. Um, so this piece was originally written for the violin. I am playing it here on an instrument called the viola d'amore. So what is a viola d'amore? Well, it's this little thing here. So it was kind of a rare bird even in the Baroque period. It has seven playing strings and it has seven sympathetic strings that run underneath the playing set, so, and the neck is hollowed out. So it's basically an Italian take on a Middle Eastern instrument. So if you're familiar with the viol or the viola da gamba, it's similar to a bass where it has the sloped shoulders and the flat back. Um, now you'll see there's a little bit of a play on words in this instrument. So most of them have a blindfolded cherub carved on top to symbolize that love is blind and that the instrument sounded so nice when it was played, but also instead of having an F here for the opening, it's actually a saber of Islam, and that's nodding its head towards the Moorish influence, and the, the Moors were the invaders of the time. 
So it's thought that this instrument may have been called viola da moor, viola of the moors. So instead of deciding, instrument makers embrace the play on words. So is it viola da more or viola da moor? So I hope you enjoy. This is Sonata Duodecima.
who said that nuns weren't fun? Okay. <laughs> she was pretty spicy, so. Okay, so next on the program, we'll be staying in Italy, um, and we'll fast forward about 34 years and move east all the way to Venice. Farnace is an opera composed by Antonio Vivaldi. Farnace had its first performance in 1727. Sadly, the opera slipped into obscurity until the last quarter of the 20th century. The opera tells the story of Farnace II. I could tell you the whole complicated plot, or I could just say there's a love triangle, there's jealousy, there's backstabbing, and a lot of rolling around. Um, somehow everybody is happy in the end, and that's all you have to know. Uh, <laughs> So we will not be playing the whole opera today, rather just a um, movement from the opening Sinfonietta. Um, and this is one of the pieces that inspired my love of Baroque music and kind of got me addicted to this whole thing. So <laughs> I hope you enjoy. <laughs> So now we move um, south to the capital of Rome, where Archangelo Corelli was an absolute rock star. Corelli enjoyed quite a bit of early fame in his career, um, and his violin sonatas were printed more than any other composition at that point in time. Um, in faraway England, Roger North, who was a friend of Henry Purcell, a passionate amateur musician and a prolific writer on music, said of Corelli's sonatas, it is wonderful to observe what a scratching of Corelli there is everywhere. Nothing will relish but Corelli. 
Um, and no wonder, after the great master made that instrument speak, as if it were a human voice. Um, now, a defining feature of Baroque music is ornamentation, which is similar to improvisation. In jazz, we hear the tune played plainly through the first time, and then each time through, um, a musician will take a turn with their own sort of version. And this is kind of similar to what we're doing here. So, and this is something we re rarely hear in classical music. Um, and, and it's no wonder, because if you had an orchestra of 80 people and everybody was doing whatever they wanted, it would be absolute chaos. But there's only four of us, so it's a little bit of chaos. Uh, so, but um, improvisation and ornamentation were expected of the Baroque musician, and audiences would gather to hear these well-loved Corelli sonatas, but um, these performances were also about hearing each other's take on the sonatas through their ability to ornament. So if you didn't play enough ornaments, you were considered dull and passe. And if you played too many ornaments, you were considered self-indulgent. And what could be worse in the 1700s? <laughs> so, Sarah will be performing Corelli's Sonata No. 9. Uh, many of these movements have repeats, so you'll hear the music as it was written first by Corelli. Then you will hear Sarah's wonderfully improvised or ornaments. So, enjoy. <laughs>
That was wonderful. I was listening through the door. Everything sounded great. Um, one thing I failed to mention while I ran off stage is a unique feature of this instrument is that you tune into the key that you're playing. So while she was playing beautiful music, I was back there changing strings and cursing the heavens. Um, so I was tuned in D minor before, but you can tune up one of them to be D major. It kind of changes the whole mood of the instrument. So um, I just want to say thank you all so much for being here today. Um, have you had a good time so far? Well, that's what we love to hear. So, and I think I speak for all the musicians here when I say we feel a deep sense of gratitude for your support and interest in what we bring uh, to our community. Um, so you all are the only reason that we were able to do what we do here today. Um, so if you'd like to have us back next season, please consider making a donation in any amount. Um, we are still a very young organization, so every dollar truly does um, go a long way to ensuring that we'll bring uh, music back next season. Um, and we have a bunch of different ways you can donate. Um, if you open up those programs, there's a QR code that you can scan to make a tax uh, de deductible donation. Uh, you can do it through our website, stpetebaroque.org. We've also got donation boxes outside the church, and you can also write a check. Um, there's a table there that explains exactly how to do it. And we even have check, check stamps, so you can just stamp, stamp, and it's easy. Um, okay, so every donation truly does go a long way, so thank you. Um, for the next piece on the program, we move north to uh, Paris, France, in the year 1771. Louis Toussaint Milandre was a composer and musician in the court of King Louis XV. Um, there isn't much known about his life other than a publication he left behind called The Easy Method for the Viola de More. Um, I can't recommend it enough for those of you aspiring Viola de More players. Just pick it up and it's great. Um, <laughs> And this book is actually how I learned to play this instrument. So there are little exercises in the book at the beginning, and it's little fragments of melodies. And by the end, you're playing whole tunes. And so at the back of the book, there are whole pieces, little trios and sonatas. But one piece really struck me in particular. And it's a very simple piece called Oh, What Love. Um, and I was stunned by how much could be said with so little. And made me realize that music doesn't have to be complex to be incredibly profound. Um, and so every time I hear this piece, it evo evokes such a strong sense of love and longing and of gratitude. And so I wanted to program this piece for you all to say thank you, to say thank you for being here, um, thank you for supporting our mission, and thank you for helping us to ensure that we can be uh, providing this kind of music uh, for years to come. So I hope you enjoy.
Okay, well I'm sad to say we've reached our final piece for today. Um, we've had so much fun for pl uh, playing for you all, um, so please stay afterwards for a light reception um, with snacks and wine generously provided by the church. I'll be having some wine. Um, so again, if you have any questions about the instruments, please come say hi if you want to look at them and we'll answer anything you'd like to know. Um, and if you're interested, after the reception, there will be a guided tour of these absolutely stunning paintings by George Innes Jr., also provided generously by the church. So for our final piece today, uh, we'll be moving into, uh, not into any one specific region, but rather all regions of Europe and even St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, and this piece spans from the 1660s to 2019. Um, so I'm sure that many of you have heard of the tune La Folia, and if you haven't, you're probably going to recognize it. La Folia translates to the madness, and it was first developed out of folk music from Portugal in the 1400s. Um, the madness refers to the frenzied way that peasants twirled to the music. Um, the peasant dance was described, as, uh, was described by some as very noisy, while others highlighted its vivacity and fire. Uh, fire. So I think the latter group sounds a little more fun at a party. Um, so and it was said that these dancers made gestures that would awaken voluptuousness. I don't even know what that means, but it certainly is <laughs> evocative. So essentially, La Folia is a 16-bar form with the same chords over and over again. Um, and it really is just an early pop song that everybody could riff on. So one begins with the theme, and then each variation should become increasingly more wild, hence the madness. Um, so La Folia became popular in the late 1400s and is still quite popular today. By 1760, it had reached Mexico and Bolivia, um, and nearly every Baroque composer has tried their hand at La Folia. Um, so it even made its way into the second movement of Beethoven's Symphony No. 5, measure 166 for those of you that keep track. Um, <laughs> additionally, Berlioz, Brahms, Liszt, and Rachmaninoff all used the theme. Even more striking is it can be found in pop music of today. For example, there was a tune by a singer called Britney Spears called Oops, I Did It Again. And now, the chorus has the exact same chords as La Folia. And for your listening delight, I've arranged a little bit of it uh, for the harpsichord. So, Brent, would you go ahead and play the first eight measures of La Folia as it originally is? Thank you, Brent. Now, um, it sounds familiar, right? So um, why don't you go ahead and give us this, the, the same version by Ms. Spear. So it's a different <laughs> melody, same bass line. So yeah, still popular today. Um, oh, I almost forgot one thing. We're trying something new with these little candles, so we've put these out. Um, if you like them, pe please feel free to take one. You'll notice many of them have a QR code on the bottom, so if you feel so inclined and the spirit moves you to make a, a donation, go right ahead. But you know, please feel free to take them. Um, they're yours to have. So okay. <laughs> So why is the piece we are calling, uh, playing for you today called Folias de Saint Pete? Well, simply, it's because I've arranged La Folia variations from different composers that I, would thought, I thought would be very fun to play. So I wrote about five of the variations that you'll hear, and I'll leave it for you to decide which they are. I think some will be quite obvious, while others may be a bit more sneaky. Um, so this piece I've cobbled together has variations by Vivaldi, Marin Murray, Corelli, and um, one recently discovered anonymous manuscript. 
So um, you all have been great today. We are St. Pete Baroque, and this is Folios to St. Pete. One second, technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, so we're going to live with Alpha. Okay.
We want to thank the uh, St. Pete Baroque Ensemble for an excellent concert. Uh, wow, it was wonderful. The only thing that can follow that is a uh, lot is wine and cheese. <laughs> And we have it waiting for you this way. Now, you can exit through this door, or if you wish, you can exit through the doors in the uh, belt.